Amen. All right, so uh, we're going to jump right in this morning. We have a series of of topics that we want to hit. Uh, you know, I've done questions about freedom for some time now, and uh, and this morning Mike is with us, and we've got a new set of questions, and some of these he'll take, and some of them I'll take, and we'll both kind of banter off of each other as well. So get ready for it. The first question goes to Mike. Uh, Mike, take it away. Okay, so Romans 6 says that we are under grace, not under law, but what about obedience, in quotes, in that chapter? So Romans 6, verse 16, I thought I'd read. It's the, the person that was uh, writing the question asked specifically about Romans 6, 16. And so here's what it says. I'm not in the right place. I thought I had it marked. Yeah, maybe I'm go going ahead. this way. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Mike, uh, you Towards know there weren't a lot of sword is. drills. There uh, weren't. There. <laughs> There's supposed to be grace for that. <laughs> I was testing you. Yes. You failed and now you're condemned. <laughs> there All you right. go. There Woo-hoo. you go. All right. Romans six verse sixteen says. It's still on the wrong page. Says. You were actually on the splits. right page. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who knew it was going to be such a tough question? I haven't even gotten to it yet. This is the hardest part, I promise. <laughs> All right. It says, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? And then the very next verse, 17, says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So here's the deal. Is obedience part of New Covenant teaching? Absolutely. The difference is it's sourced and motivated by something entirely different. Uh, People often get confused in Romans 6 because... They misunderstand kind of what freedom is. There's an idea, especially in our culture, that freedom means uh, that I'm not influenced by anything else. I'm self-determining. I can determine what I do. I can decide completely independent of any other influence, and that's freedom. But you can't decide to not breathe, at least not for long. You can't decide to not eat, at least not for long. In other words, there are things that you can decide that bring you life, and there are things that you can decide that bring you death. And when we were under sin, when sin reigned in our life, when we did not know Christ, when he hadn't taken up residence in us, uh, we didn't have the choice to do the things that bring life. But now that we've been brought to Christ, we actually can choose still to live, make those choices that bring about a death in our experience. Or we now, with Christ, can choose to live from him and from his life by grace. And so we do choose to be obedient, but it's a matter of presenting ourselves available to God based on our trust of him instead of uh, presenting ourselves thinking it's for ourselves, but really it's to sin, to be a slave to sin that brings about death. Does that make sense? It's a whole different thing. Obedience is our following after the spirit instead of following after the flesh. And if we follow after the flesh, that's still an option, but it's going to produce death in our experience because we cannot produce life from circumstances. But if we follow after the Spirit, the Spirit will lead us in all righteousness. So that's life and peace to us. Yeah, and I want to just focus on this phrase, obedient from the heart. Uh, Obedient from the heart means that suddenly there's no masquerade. uh, There's no pretending suddenly um, what is produced on the outside, the Christian life, can match what is on the inside. So my motives can be real and my motives can be genuine. Uh, Growing up, we we thought it was humble to say we had a dirty, wicked heart as Christians, but that's not really what humility is. Here, Romans 6 is saying that your heart has become an obedient heart. Um, So there's this purity to your heart now. And so basically, Christianity is waking up every day and dis- discovering the purity of your heart, not the wickedness of your heart, but the purity of your heart. And that's what the gospel has done. It's turned a wicked heart into a pure heart. So we can trust our hearts. We, we can be obedient from the heart. And there's really no faking to it because there's been that heart surgery. 
Yeah, it's the difference between trying and trusting. If we are trying to be good, then we're living from uh, living a lie that we are independent of God. Like, I've got to do something to be godly. But if we know who we are, then we can live from who we are as he's made us. But that's always by faith, and, uh, through faith, by, by, or, uh, by grace, through faith. I was trying to say it backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now this next question is very interesting. Uh, it comes up a lot. I mean, we talk about grace. We talk about the New Testament, the New Covenant. We talk about the effect of the finished work of Jesus Christ. But how were Old Testament people saved? How did this really work in the Old Testament? Well, I think it's really important that we see the Bible basically as a law sandwich. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, we've got uh, the promise, and then we've got the law, and then we've got the fulfilling of the promise in the New Covenant, which was promised before the law. Okay, so uh, there were people who had a way of faith before the law ever came in. And so we might get confused about the role of the law. We might think that the law, uh, God maybe had an agenda for the law to save some people or something. In fact, that's what a lot of Jews mistakenly thought. But the law saved exactly zero people. In its lifetime, the law has saved zero people. No one has ever been justified by the law. And so even during the era of the law, people were still saved by faith. It's like two currents that were running simultaneously, but one leads to death and one leads to life. And so the whole point was hop out of the law current and hop into the grace of God by faith. And so this was true forever. These two streams have always been running, faith in God versus the law since it came in. So what's so um, ironic is that the Bible tells us the law came in so that sin would increase. Uh, so, so the law's job was actually to enhance the disgusting flavor of sin. Uh, it's a flavor enhancer. Sin was always there. <laughs> sin was always there. Uh, death was there and sin was there from Adam until Moses. But what Moses brought down that mountain was a way for people, it was like a microscope. It was a way for people to see sin in an enhanced way. Um, suddenly it was magnified. Like my, my mom, when I was a kid, she had this mirror that she would look at at normal magnification, then you'd flip it, and on the back it would be like ten times to see all the blemishes, right? So that's what, not that my mom had blemishes. We see where that is, yeah, right. Ah, you guys, you always go there. Uh, but but that, that magnification is what the law is, is for. Um, so, so remember now, and I'll finish with this. I mean, just imagine, this is the analogy that I think works so well. I mean, you work a car deal, and you go home, and you paid 20 grand for this car, and then you know, uh, 430 days later, you get a voicemail from the dealer who says, come back, you owe more money. And you're like, no way, I negotiated this thing 430 days ago. Well, 430 years before the law, the promise was given. 430 years before the law, the promise was given. So the fact that the law comes in so very late, decades, hundreds of years later, it does not nullify the promise. The promise has always been that there's a way of faith, and faith is what saves us. It's never been about the law. Yeah, so to answer, kind of put a, uh, just a highlighter on what Drew was saying, how were people in the Old Testament saved? They were saved just like you. They were putting their faith in the provision of God by grace. And so that hope that they were walking through the sacramental system, uh, the sacrificial system, the whole purpose of the uh, uh, the traditional feasts and uh, the whole religious process was they're putting their faith in their savior that God spoke to Eve. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to David. He was pointing them towards a Messiah who was the chosen one of God to save them from their sin instead of a sacrificial system, which was just a, a, a band-aid. They were putting their faith in something that had yet to come. And that was their act of faith showing that they were putting their faith in that. So it was by Jesus. They just didn't know Jesus. They didn't know when he was going to come exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it was always through Christ. They just didn't know who Christ was yet. All right. So, Mike, uh, here, here's another one where uh, you take the lead on this. I mean, Psalm 139, it says, search me, you know, see if there's any wicked way in me. Uh, what is the role for that kind of business, those kind of thoughts under the new covenant with, with grace happening? What, what's the deal? Yeah, there's a lot of wonderful passages in the Old 
Testament that say, you know, search me and know me and see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in your way that's everlasting. That's Psalm 139. Uh, there are other passages where David specifically in the Psalms is saying, you know, like a deer pants for water. Oh, I long for you, oh God. Well, that's a good heart, right? Anybody here longed for God? I have. I think that's, a, that's what he's designed us for. There's something in us that requires, has no life apart from the presence of God. And David experienced that presence as an external reality, but he also experienced the absence of that. He was on the seesaw of behavior of his own faith and his own focus. What he was longing for, Christ has fulfilled. When he said, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting, Jesus said, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. So the way that you walk is Jesus. You walk with him. And the truth that you know as you walk with him is Jesus. And the life that you experience as you walk and know Jesus is Jesus. And so the very things that the Old Testament prophets and psalmists were longing for and crying out for are ours in the person of Jesus Christ. So what do we do with these kinds of passages? Well, we celebrate them, right? David's heart is right. He's living according to what was available to him. And so we can even sing those songs so long as we recognize the old covenant promise in those psalms, the old covenant promise that the prophets longed to see. Jesus himself in Matthew 13 said, many have longed to see the day that you now see and to hear what you now hear. This is what they're pointed towards through the entire Old Testament. So we can celebrate that promise, we can celebrate that desire, but we also need to recognize and enjoy that it's fulfilled in the person of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, you've got this idea that we're supposed to self-analyze and self-critique, and a lot of Christians, we end up blowing the whistle on ourselves more than God ever would. Uh, we're harder on ourselves than the God of the universe is sometimes. And so, I think, you know, for me, it comes down to, am I supposed to inspect myself all the time? Am I my own fruit inspector? Or is there someone else who's going to run this show? <laughs> and, um, you know, Paul said it means very little. This is, I'm quoting from Paul here. He says, it means very little to me that any of you examine me. And in fact, the one who examines me is the Lord. And so there's a releasing of um, trying to please people all the time. Uh, that can be a, a law. Thou shalt please everybody. Thou shalt make everybody happy. Thou shalt fulfill the expectations of everybody around you. And Paul, you know, good luck with that, right? That works for about a week, and then you're done. You're exhausted. You're toast. <laughs> and so really what the gospel is doing is freeing us from other people's expectations and freeing us from our expectations of ourselves. And then, instead, we're submitting to someone else's opinion. Isn't that kind of interesting that, that this Christian life is, you know, righteousness by faith is submitting to someone else's opinion of you. And it just so happens that it's the God of the universe and he's right about you. And his opinion of you is absolutely off the charts. I mean, his opinion of you is so amazing. And so righteousness by faith says, I'm going with your opinion of me instead of my opinion of me because my opinion of me sometimes is way off base. I'm looking at my performance. I'm looking at my sins. I'm looking at uh, my commitment, my dedication, my steadfastness, which isn't there. And I'm looking at all this stuff and I'm graphing and I'm charting and I'm trying to figure out where I am with you. And he's saying, forget that. Forget about it. Forget about it and just trust in me and my opinion of you. All right, so uh, this next one is about sanctification. And, you know, Mike, we've, uh, we've talked about this one a, a little bit recently here at Church Without Religion. But this person wants to know, basically, um, is sanctification a finished process or is it an, an ongoing process? And before we before we get into the depths of this, I mean, just remember what we've said in the past here, that there's me and then there's my behavior. Uh, there are verses right. about me as a person, and then there's verses about my behavior. And there's a sanctification, which, by the way, this is not a fancy term. It doesn't mean something so complex. It means set apart. Like, I set this paper apart this morning when I wrote on it. I, I'm using it for the purpose for which it's intended. 
Um, if I balled it up and shoved it in my ear, uh, I wouldn't be setting it apart for its designed purpose. And it's, you'd look funny. And I'd look funny. But instead, I wrote on it. So sanctifying is setting apart for a purpose. So you as a person have been set apart. If you're a Christian, you're set apart. You can't get any more set apart. Ten more times at church, three more times in the Word of God, two more quiet times, and three more mission trips. It's not going to make you any more set apart. You belong to God 100%. Attitudes and actions, different story, under construction, things are being set apart. So the problem is, Mike... When we take these two types of sanctification, me and my behavior, and we do this, and this is what the Christian world is doing. They're bringing them together, and they're saying, oh, look, sanctification is progressive. You are progressively getting cleaner. Right. So talk, talk about why that's a big deal, why it's a problem. I mean, why is it important to understand this? Sure. We quote Galatians 2.20 all the time, right? I, apart from Christ, have been crucified with Christ, and I, apart from him, no longer live. But Christ now lives in me, so the life I live in this body, in the flesh, I live by faith, dependent on him who loved me and gave himself for me. What we don't quote a lot is verse 21 that says, if righteousness, right, if becoming better, if being right with God, if being who I'm supposed to be, if righteousness could come by the law, if I, could, if I could somehow earn my way to betterness, then Christ died for nothing. And so sanctification is not me getting better. Sanctification is me being convinced of who I am. The more I realize who I already am, the more I live out of that reality. Ian Thomas said that you cannot live beyond what you believe. So our problem is not who we are. The problem is who we believe we are. And that's where I know who I am, but I'm increasingly convinced of who I am in Christ. So this paper that Drew was talking about, I thought that was a great uh, illustration. He's already pulled it out of the notebook or wherever he got it. He's already set it aside and said, this is my notes for today. He can't make it anymore his notes, but he could still write on it, right? So tomorrow you're going to get up and God's going to continue to write his life in your circumstances. That doesn't make you any more set apart. That just means he's continuing to do the very thing he's already done in your life. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. So the next question. Oh, thank you. Yeah, God yeah. is good. Woo! He done good work. All right, go for it. Sure. In the four Gospels, did Jesus teach law or did he teach grace? Did Jesus teach the law mm. when he was on earth and walked around mm -hmm. or did he teach grace? The answer is yes. <laughs> Which did he teach? Yes. And here's why. Yeah, let me read a passage. I already looked it up, so you don't have to watch me flip, because that was embarrassing. So glad, glad, as Drew said, I'm not living from your perceptions, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Galatians 3, verse 24 says, So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, or a better word for that is tutor, in order that we might be justified by faith. In other words, we weren't coming to the law to be justified. We were coming to the law to be justified by Christ, to give up on self-performance. So when Jesus came in uh, Matthew 5 and did the Sermon on the Mount, he was elevating the law because anyone who thinks they could be justified apart from faith had to learn that they were wrong. So he said things like, you know what, you think that you're lawful because you haven't killed anybody. But have you ever wished someone didn't exist? Because if you hated someone, but you're just scared of the consequences of knocking them off, mm -hmm. then you're still a murderer in your heart. That's still who you are. You're just as condemned. You're just scared of your own selfish consequences. So the fact that you won't do it for yourself, but you wish you could do it for yourself, just means you're a conflicted sinner. It doesn't mean you're less of a sinner. So he's elevating the law because people actually thought they were being justified by the law. So Jesus came and taught the law in its fullness so that no one would pass. He ministered under the law. It says he was born under the law so that he could minister under the law so that he could fulfill the law in us. So the law isn't needing to be fulfilled any longer, though Jesus did teach the law. The law that Jesus taught that said you can't hate and still pass by the law. You can't lust and still pass by the law. You can't want your own way. Anybody ever wanted your own way? 
Mm. You can't wish that you had something God hadn't given you or he's given someone else. You can't do that and pass by the law. That law has been fulfilled already in you because guess what you want? You want what God wants. And guess who you are? You're whole and healthy and complete and perfect in Christ. So he has fulfilled the law by making you the very person that you were always designed to be. And he did it apart from the law, but he had to elevate the law so that people would give up on it so that they would come to him and be regenerated by their faith in him as a new creation. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so um, people often ask, how can you tell what Jesus is doing? Like, who are we to pick through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and decide, oh, this is law, oh, this is grace, oh, this is law, oh, this is grace. Uh, well, what I would say is the best way to look at interpreting the, the harsh words of Jesus, the impossible words of Jesus. By the way, if you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, be perfect, sell everything. You won't be forgiven unless you forgive others. If you forgive others, God will forgive you. If you don't, he won't forgive you. These are the harsh, uh, maybe you could say the impossible teachings of Jesus Christ. So how, how can we, where do we come off just saying, you know, this is uh, law and this is grace and this is law as we're looking through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Well, what I would say is remember what Jesus told the disciples. Jesus told them that to go and teach everything that he had taught them to teach. He gave them a mandate. Now, do you think the disciples listened to him? Well, sure they did. Well, where is the evidence of what the disciples taught? Well, it's, it's in the epistles. Paul, Peter, James, John, they wrote these epistles to the church in obedience to Jesus. Now, as I look through Paul, Peter, James, and John, do I find anything about amputating body parts? Do I find anything about selling everything in order to enter the kingdom of heaven? Do I find anything about a conditional forgiveness where if I do my part first, then God will do his part second? No, of course, I don't find those things in the epistles. So by using a little bit of biblical logic, some context, what we're doing is we're working backwards and we're seeing, well, then Jesus, why would you say these things? And then it becomes obvious Jesus, who were you talking to? I was talking to Jewish people. Jesus, when were you talking? Well, it was before the cross. Jesus, why were you saying these things? What effect did you want? Well, the rich man went away sad. The Pharisees went away mad. Mission accomplished. What was the mission, Jesus? Again, it's what Mike said. To bury people under the this, under this sense that they couldn't do it. If they thought they could do it, here's a newsflash. You can't. You thought the standard was here. I'm showing you the standard is really here. So that's a really important one as we work our way through the four Gospels. Now, um, let's go to the next one, and um, I'll start off for this. It says, what about the scripture jewels in your crown? Well, it doesn't exist. All right. Good. Let's go to the next one. Okay. But seriously, folks, uh, Jewels in your crown. This is a really interesting idea. Uh, it's Christianese. It's jargon. Uh, it's just not in the Bible. The idea that we would be collecting seven and nine and twelve and fifteen crowns or jewels in our crown or a dozen crowns over time. You know, I, you know how I'd like to joke about this stuff. I mean, imagine yourself with a dozen crowns on your head and a crick in your neck from all your righteousness, sitting in heaven, you know, bragging about... So righteous it hurts. Yes. And then, you know, like other people say it's not about crowns or jewels, it's about square footage, you know, in heaven, you know, and all that. And I joke about Beverly Heavens and how some of us will be in Beverly Heavens and others will be across the tracks, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, all of this stuff is very interesting, um, but it's made up stuff. Now, what does the Bible actually say? I mean, it says there's a crown of righteousness. Uh, it says, you know, but who's your righteousness? Jesus. And then it says there's a crown of life. Who's your life? Jesus. Can you wear two crowns at once? Are we really going to be stacking these things? What's the point? I mean, come on. Crown of righteousness, crown of life. Uh, there's various different references to a crown, but every single time it comes back to the gift that we have by faith in Jesus Christ. So there are, uh, in the book of Revelation, there are 24 elders who, who uh, in this vision that John had, they get a crown and they toss it at Jesus' feet. So uh, 24 people do this. 
uh, and immediately they say, wow, this crown of righteousness, this righteousness is awesome. Where did it come from? Oh, Jesus, I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. So this idea that we're collecting jewelry, you know, that we're... Bling. bling. Holy bling. Yeah, heavenly bling, this huge honking jewels in our crowns. I mean, this whole thing is just, um, it's nuts, it, 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 isn't it, Mike? Yeah, it's crazy. I, I think that we have such a materialistic mindset as if the purpose of our walk with God here or once we graduate into his eternal presence, we have this weird idea that we are pursuing God for something besides God. Hmm. And we have all things in Christ. So the best thing that we could have, since we have all things in him, I mean, we think that our circumstances will give us peace, but he is our peace. So if we want to experience more peace, do we need better circumstances or do we need, need a deeper fellowship with Christ? Do we need to be more dependent upon him tomorrow or do we need to use him to get more of what we want from our circumstances? So I don't think that's going to change when we get into his uh, eternal presence. I think that we walk with him so that we can experience more of him who is our life and our peace and our joy and our love. So to say that he's going to share his glory with us, we're going to go, wow, God is awesome. And he's going to go, and you received it. So I'm going to share. he's not going to share his glory, but we participate in it with him. And so he points to us going, I love you. And we're going to go, yeah, but it's just because of you. And he's going to go, yeah, but you are the object of it. Yeah, but you are the creator of it. So we're going to be engaging in this exchange of his love to us and back to him forever because he's our life and he's our fruit producer. And so that's the reward. We try to make it something besides him. And yet if we have him, what else do we need? Beautiful. Yeah. Paul said everything else is dung next to knowing Christ, mm -hmm. and that's not going to change. All right, uh, Mike, uh, how does one practically apply the implications of being dead to sin? We talk about this dead to sin, alive to God a lot, but put some legs on it. I mean, how is it practical when the thoughts are coming, temptation is there, or accusation? Like, how do, what are the practical implications of dead to sin? Yeah, there's a, a lie that dead to sin is the same as saying free from temptation. So the person was asking uh, this question when we looked at the card, he went on to say, you know, because I still have this sinful behavior, I have some addiction struggles, how do I practically live dead to sin? Well, you don't make yourself more dead. Uh, I think we're trying to get free of temptation. We're trying to get rid of the flesh patterns that we've learned. You know, when I, as a child cried, I got fed. So I learned really quickly that what I do has consequence. Uh, good or bad. And so we learn to live by our behavior before we come to know Christ and say, apart from your grace, I can't breathe. I can't tie my shoes. I can't drive my car, much less raise a teenager or uh, speak your word or, you know, reveal your revelation to anyone. I can't do the things that only you can do in and through me. We realize that the flesh never produced life. But we still have those patterns of living, those patterns of coping. And so we, there's a lie that says being dead to sin means free of temptation. But those flesh patterns still exist in this body for a season. Isn't that good news? It's going to go away. It's just not going to go away in this physical lifetime. But we still have temptation. The truth is that being dead to sin means being alive to Christ. It doesn't mean being dead to temptation doesn't mean that there's no flesh patterns that I've learned and I still try to cope and self-soothe with. It means that if I reckon myself as dead, not try to get more dead, but Romans 6 says, so since you're dead, reckon yourselves as dead to sin and alive to Christ. So being dead to sin doesn't mean you're free of temptation. You're still going to have temptation. It means that since you're alive to Christ, you don't have to live in the consequences and death of giving in to that temptation. You have another source. So if we can stop saying, oh, I'm not experiencing Christ's life. I'm still tempted. Was Jesus tempted? Mm -hmm. He was, right? Mm -hmm. Were the disciples tempted? Absolutely. Was Adam before the fall tempted? Yes, he was. So if we think that being in Christ means we're not going to be tempted, that's not very Christ-like. <laughs> but instead, for me to have a different life, a different faith, a different focus, to fix my eyes on him who is the author and perfecter of my faith, instead of me trying to perfect my own faith, uh, that changes the dynamic of my life. When I am tempted, I look to him, not try to overcome my sin, not try to fix my flesh, not to try to be a better me for him, but try to be who he has made me from him. That's being alive to Christ instead of being dead to temptation. There is no such thing in this life. Mm. 
Yeah, you know, we freak out. I mean, I often freak out about the, the volume of the temptation. I mean, literally the audio, the volume of the temptation or the frequency of the temptation, right? So do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like, oh my goodness, I've been a Christian for five years. I've been a Christian for 15 years. I've been a Christian for 40 years. Wouldn't you think the thoughts would go away? Well, the thoughts don't go away, but what the enemy wants me to do is freak out about the volume of the thoughts, how loud they are, and also how persistent they are. Oh, how could you be a real child of God if these thoughts are so loud and they're so persistent? And so we get the thoughts, and then maybe the thoughts are fearful thoughts, and then we get fear about thinking the fearful thoughts. We're fearful about being fearful. <laughs> We're anxious about being anxious. We're freaking out about being tempted. So what I, what I feel like I'm learning is that I don't judge a thought by its volume or by its frequency. I judge a thought by its truth value. And so, you know, it's like the old story in the Old Testament when the prophet was there hanging out next to the cave and, you know, there comes a big whirlwind and there becomes a big, uh, you know, torrential rains and all this loud noise, but God wasn't in it. And then there's this quiet breeze and this whisper, so to speak, of God's voice. And that's, that's what God was in. He wasn't in the volume. He wasn't in the frequency. He was this still small voice, so to speak. And what I think we take from that is that God's spirit lives in us. So um, what, what the new normal is, this is the new normal. The new normal is that God's spirit is always in communication with us. And so we don't have to wait for an extraneous message, a loud message, um, some sort of obnoxious, persistent message. We're looking for the, the normal and the everyday where I live in the spirit and the spirit lives in me and um, he's already communicating with us. Does that make sense? We're joined with him and so what feels like us, get this now, what feels like us is really us. You see what I'm saying? What feels like me all by myself, what feels like normal uh, is really me and God. There is no me apart from God now. That's right. There is no me off in a corner. It's me and God. So the new normal is me and God having coffee, me and God taking the kids to school, me and God at work, me and God at school. The new normal is me joined to Christ. And so it may feel very normal sometimes, but it doesn't take away the fact that you are united to him. And don't judge a thought by its volume or its frequency. Judge it by its truth value. Yeah, I think the problem, uh, that's really good. I, I love the idea that the new normal is that you're in Christ, and when you don't feel like it, it doesn't change what the truth is. But the problem is that the enemy has convinced us because of the flesh patterns, because of those tempting desires that we think are us, he's convinced us to identify more with the flesh than with Christ. And you're in union with Christ, who is in, at odds with the flesh, and so the enemy can't take our life from him. He just can just can try to convince us that that's not who we are. So when you're talking to God about temptation, when you're talking to God about sin, when you're talking about those things that you don't like about your life, instead of identifying with what isn't of Christ, what would it look like to recognize that as the work of the enemy and not who you are and identify more with Christ who defines you and you're in union with and you are identifying with the flesh that's not you. It's in you, but it's not you. You're freer than that. So we have to identify its source, not, not identify based on volume. This is so consistently prevalent. It must be me. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, we're, gonna, we're running out of time, but we're gonna, I'm just going to briefly address this, and then we'll close. Uh, what about the Bema seat judgment? Okay, so I, we, we talked about this recently in church, maybe a month or two ago. Um, you know, it's a very popular idea that there are two judgments, one for the world and one for humans in general, and then like a second judgment for Christians only where you get the really, really good stuff, you know, or you don't. You're sitting there empty-handed because you didn't do a lot or you got saved really late in life or whatever. So what does that say about the parable of the vineyard workers? Well, that would negate everything. Do we really believe that grace ends in heaven? Uh, remember, they all got paid the same in the parable of the vineyard workers. That's they were great. working for an hour or an eight-hour day, and they all lined up and got paid the same. Does grace stop in heaven? Well, certainly not. 
Now, let's talk about this, just this common misconception. What I believe, again, this is just my opinion, but what I believe is there's a common misconception, of, uh, and it comes out of 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says we must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ to receive what is due, whether good or bad. We're recompensed for good or bad. So who is that talking to? Who is recompensed for bad deeds? Well, not Christians. What do you call bad deeds? Sin. Sin. Sin is the synonym for bad deeds. So who is it that's paid back for bad deeds? Well, it's the unbeliever, not the believer. So when it says we must all appear, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that's referring to humans. And then some of those humans are recompensed for good deeds, even a cup of water in his name. And others are recompensed for bad deeds, just like Revelation 21. The books are opened. If you're not in the books, then you're judged according to your deeds. So what I'm saying is, is that the great white throne is a wonderful place to sit. And the Bema seat is a wonderful place to sit. And they're the same place. They're, they're the same event. God doesn't need one event and then six hours later another event or one event and two weeks later in heaven another event. He is assessing all of humanity. It's sheep or goats, pass or fail, black and white. It's super clear and obvious in the book or not in the book. Uh, and then if you're in the book, then everything you do, even a cup of water in his name, is a representation of him because he's in you and you're in him. And so he's going to celebrate everything, everything that he did through you. But it's really all about what he did through you. It's not about the size of your house or the size of some jewelry or a gift package awaiting you in heaven's gift shop. All of that stuff is nonsense. It's about Jesus from start to finish. Yeah, I think we have a, a problem because we want everything to be chronological and God is operating in the spiritual, not in the physical. So we want to go, okay, what time is the Bema Seat judgment? I don't want to miss that. Is that after the White Throne judgment? Is that, you know, what am I supposed to be at? Where's the agenda? And so we try to look at the, the events of eternity from a very human perspective. And so God, in his grace, has given us pictures of that that look very linear to us, very chronological to us. And so it, nowhere in scripture does it say, by the way, those are the same throne. Those are the same event. It doesn't say that, nor does it need to. Those are all things that are going to happen, and we can put our faith in them. But what is happening in heaven is not operating in our terms. And so the only way to really reconcile what Drew is talking about is who's going to be rewarded for both of those things. The people who are operating by faith and experiencing the life of God have to be present but not judged when the people who are being judged for their sin and evil deeds are also being present. And so it makes a lot of sense to reconcile it that way. Whether or not you agree with that or don't agree with that, that doesn't change anything about our life in Christ or our salvation, but it does mean that, that uh, what Scripture is giving us is what we can handle, and it's completely true, and it's going to be in God's terms, not ours. Praise God. Yeah. So as you, as you study this out, and I encourage you to do it, I mean, you look for the occurrences of the word Bema in the Bible, and what you find is not sweet passages about getting a bunch of medals hanging around your neck. What you find is like the proconsul Gallio is sitting on the Bema where he judges and punishes people from it. So this idea that Bema is a sweet place of reward only really doesn't hold true. It's the Bema seat of who? Of Christ. Well, where does Christ sit? On the great white throne. So, you know, we're talking about this grand event where uh, Jesus Christ is showing off everything that he's done in and through us. And also, to those who are not in the book of life, they've rejected the gospel, and it's a black and white thing, and Christians need not worry. That's the biggest thing out of this. Christians need not worry. If you fear, it's because you're not perfected in God's love. Fear involves punishment, but there's no punishment for you. And so let's be perfected in the love of God. Excellent. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for today, and we just thank you for Mike and for his ministry. We thank you for his wisdom and discernment and insight. Uh, we thank you for his heart. Uh, and Father, we just ask that uh, you would continue to deepen our understanding of this truth that sets us free. We want to be free, and you say that it was for freedom that you set us free. This is our destiny. It's our birthright. Uh, you have made it such that we as children of God now deserve to be free because that's what you've purchased and given to us. Father, uh, we just ask uh, again that you would remind us 
in the times of temptation, in the times of accusation, in the times of self-inspection, to go with you, to go with your opinion of us, because it is so amazing and so freeing. In your name we pray it. Amen. Thank you guys so much. You got a great sample of uh, Mike Daniel this morning as you've had in the past. Uh, you've heard his wisdom and his heart. I encourage you, if you're not uh, connected with Mike, get connected with him on Facebook or get his newsletter. Uh, be in contact with him because he's an awesome, awesome child of God. Uh, this morning, there was a running theme. And the running theme was that uh, we're not making these long distance phone calls to heaven, hoping that they don't bounce off the ceiling. Uh, we've got a Christ who is very present. We've got a Christ who is in, not just up, but a Christ who is in. And it's the Christ who is in that frees us from the law. It's the Christ who is in that frees us from the judgment. And it is the Christ who is in that enables us to live a life that only he can live in and through us. Christ gave his life for us to give his life to us in order to live his life through us. That's the Christ that we celebrate here. Have a great day.